On the path to Riemannian curvature lies the crucial concept of parallel transport. Though considered to be a difficult and intimidating mathematical abstraction, this concept and its immediate corollary, the notion of a connection, can in fact be grasped via very basic geometric intuition. Indeed, in a manner so simple it renders the entire field of differential geometry almost immediately comprehensible. This is dialect, and today we take another step closer towards mastering the formidable formalism of general relativity. Of all the ideas in differential geometry coded in near indecipherable mathematics, there's really nothing easier to grasp than parallel transport. What is parallel transport? Well, simple. Start with a vector on a flat 2D surface. Move this vector from point A to point B. Does it still point in the same direction at point B that it did at point A? If so, congratulations, you've successfully conducted parallel transport. That is, you've moved your vector from one part of the surface to another whilst preserving its direction with respect to that surface. And that's it. That's all there really is to parallel transport. It's an idea that allows us to talk about and compare vectors in different locations on a given surface. So what makes it complicated then? Well, what if the surface you're given isn't a flat one, but rather a curved one? For instance, say we have a vector at point A along this curved surface, and we want to parallel transport it to point B. Now, we can move it like this along the surface, and technically, this is still parallel transport, because we're keeping the vector pointing in the same direction relative to the 3D space. However, in differential geometry, we're not generally interested in transporting a vector such that it remains parallel relative to the external embedding space, but rather, we're interested in transporting it such that it remains parallel relative to the surface itself. But what does that even mean? How can a vector be kept parallel relative to a surface which can curve in any arbitrary fashion? Indeed, if you've ever happened across a demonstration of parallel transport before, it's probably left you scratching your head. For instance, given a sphere, if you parallel transport a vector along some line of latitude, it doesn't stay straight like this. Rather, it will begin to twist downwards like this. But now, parallel transport that same vector along a line of longitude, and no twisting whatsoever results. Stranger still, given some points A and B, parallel transport the same vector along different paths, and you'll find it winds up pointing in completely different directions. So, what's going on here? Well, it's actually nothing more complicated than what occurs in the case for a flat surface. These two pictures of parallel transport turn out to be, in fact, entirely identical. But how is this possible? Well, as discussed in a prior video, the entire science behind Riemannian geometry hinges on one essential trick. Which is, given any path on a curved surface, there's always a way to transpose that path onto a flat surface. For instance, given a great circle on a sphere, simply fit a cylinder to it, transfer the great circle from the sphere to the cylinder, unwrap the cylinder, and voila! You've shown that a great circle on a sphere is actually a straight line in flat space. For lines of latitude, we can perform a similar trick. First, fit a cone whose surface is perfectly tangent to the sphere along that entire line of latitude. Now, depending on where that line sits, this may require your cone be shorter and flatter, or taller and narrower. Then simply transfer your line of latitude to the cone, unwrap the cone, and voila! You've shown that lines of latitude are equivalent to circle segments in flat space. Now, notice what happens when we parallel transport a vector along these unwrapped paths. 
if we parallel transport our vector along, say, the great circle path, the angle between the vector and the path remains unchanged, in consequence of that path being a straight line. But now if we parallel transport the vector along the unwrapped latitude path, the angle between the path and the vector continually changes, precisely because this path is not straight, but rather curved. And this is exactly the same thing we see with parallel transport on the surface of the sphere. A vector situated along a great circle geodesic sees the initial surface angle between itself and the geodesic unchanged as it's transported. Because that geodesic is, relative to the surface, exactly a straight line. Meanwhile, a vector transported along a non-geodesic path, like a line of latitude, must see its angle change, precisely because that path is not a straight line with respect to the surface, but rather a curved one. Thus, when we parallel transport a vector along a non-geodesic path on a curved surface, this is equivalent to parallel transporting it along a curved path in flat space. And therefore we expect there to be a twisting of the vector. Contrarily, when we parallel transport a vector along a geodesic, this is equivalent to parallel transporting it along a straight path in flat space. And so we expect no twisting. Indeed, since geodesics define a notion of parallelism on a curved surface, then for parallel transporting a vector along any given path on that surface, we need only draw the nearest geodesic, and we can at once understand that the vector will twist as to try to stay as parallel as possible to that geodesic, mimicking exactly what would happen in flat space. Or, should the vector not initially be oriented along the direction of the transport path, then it will twist as to try to maintain the initial angle that it shared with the geodesic before it underwent transport. Now let's consider the infinitesimal case, wherein we approximate our sphere not as a smooth surface, but as a bunch of flat polygons stitched together. Here indeed it is most easy to see why and how parallel transport happens. Let's begin by setting Lego John Snow on the surface of this sphere, and then, after equipping him with a trusty war spear, ask him to walk due eastward along a line of latitude. But with the important condition that he keep his spear pointed in a constant direction as he moves. Now, for the flat portion of his path along this first piece, this will be easy enough. He simply holds his spear straight eastward as he walks, exactly along the direction of his motion. But what should he do with his spear when he reaches the threshold of the next piece? Well, to figure this out, we need to first transpose his path from curved space to flat space which simply entails unfolding this next piece such that it is aligned to the plane of the first. That is, such that it occupies the same two-dimensional space. With this accomplished, Lego Jon Snow can now clearly observe that his path eastward requires him to turn to the left relative to the surface. But since his instructions are to keep holding the spear as straight as possible, this means he has to shift his spear to the right. As he then continues along the path, we refold this piece back into place, and then when he arrives at the next piece over, we simply repeat the whole process. Now, to an observer far from the surface, it may look as though Lego Jon Snow decided to shift his spear southwards as he crossed from one piece to another. But in truth, it was Lego Jon Snow who changed directions and he simply maintained his spear in a parallel posture as he moved. But what does it really mean to unbend these pieces like we're doing, and connect them in the same two-dimensional plane? Well, that's very literally called a connection. That is, each of these pieces is essentially a tangent plane. And when the tangent planes aren't connected, 
there's no clear rule as to how mathematical operations between them should be carried out. For instance, this vector here plus this vector here makes this vector. But what does this vector here plus this vector make? Well, we can't say until we specify a connection. And in this case, that connection is specified precisely by bending these two pieces such that they lie in the same plane. Because only then can we carry out the parallel transport required to compare and add our vectors. Now, clearly this connection comes about from our pieces being embedded together in a higher dimensional space. If this space is specifically Euclidean, then such a connection is called the Levi-Civita connection. And its essential characteristics are precisely those which it inherits from Euclidean geometry. Specifically, the uniformity of the metric throughout Euclidean space means that when we parallel transport two vectors on our surface, we shouldn't expect the angle between them or their lengths to change in any way. A condition termed metric compatibility. Secondly, the uniformity of parallelism in Euclidean space means that when we parallel transport a vector from one point to another on a flat surface, we know that these two lines indicate the same direction. This latter property is captured under a condition known as being torsion-free. Together, the properties of metric compatibility and being torsion-free completely define the Levi-Civita connection. Now, if we wish to eschew either of these conditions and establish a non Levi-Civita connection, we can do so, mathematically speaking. But in turn, this requires that we ditch the notion that our surface is anything physical, and instead treat it as an abstract data structure without any prior notions of distance or parallelism imposed upon it, which is much more in line with the truer definition of a manifold. Then, when we parallel transport a vector from point A to point B, we can choose any arbitrary direction to be what we mean when we say two vectors are parallel at different points. Meaning, the vector might experience an intrinsic twist as it's transported through flat space. Or, we can also choose to define lengths and angles differently at different points so that the vectors grow, shrink, or skew as they are transported. Okay, but what do such arbitrary connections actually mean or represent? Well, nothing really. These are just expanded geometric structures that may or may not be useful for describing certain systems, physical or otherwise. For instance, though the formalism of general relativity is built around the Levi-Civita connection, it turns out you can actually ditch the idea of curved spacetime altogether, and instead, by equipping your geometry with a non-Levi-Civita connection, describe gravity purely in flat spacetime via the use of torsion fields. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. At this point, the only thing we need to concern ourselves with is the Levi-Civita connection and how it ties into our basic notion of parallel transport. Indeed, as we'll see, the simple idea of parallel transport soon becomes a very powerful tool. Firstly, it gives us a mathematical way to identify geodesics on a curved surface, thus in turn yielding the geodesic equation. But secondly, remember how we mentioned that vectors which are parallel transported along different paths on a curved surface don't end up pointing in the same direction? Well, this doesn't actually occur with vectors that are parallel transported in flat space, which suggests that the amount of mismatch between any two rejoined vectors on a curved surface gives us a means of determining that surface's curvature intrinsically. That is, without explicitly having to refer to the surface's external embedding space. Indeed, it's by exploiting this idea that we will be led, finally, to a wholly intrinsic, mathematically complete characterization of curvature, the Riemannian curvature tensor. Which means the end isn't too far in sight. This has been Dialect, 
As always, thanks for watching.